Captain Picard does not like small animals. Loaxana Troy reacted badly to Deanna's Betazoid kitten. And Ensign Davies likes to break up married teams. What's up with that? Hello, everybody, and welcome <laughs> to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we're doing a review of Star Trek The Next Generation Season 2, Episode 15, entitled Pen Pals. Story by Hannah Louise Shear, teleplay by Melinda M. Snodgrass, and this was directed by Weinrich Colby. This was April 29th, 1989. Where were you? What's up, Sirach? How are you today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Yeah, uh, everybody, before we get started, please make sure you like this video. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel and you hit the bell icon for notifications every time we come out with a new video. Uh, if you are listening in, please be sure to give us a five-star rating wherever you get your podcasts uh, and leave us a nice review there. Remember, if you're watching us on YouTube, you can also listen to us wherever you get podcasts. If you're listening to us uh, wherever you get your podcasts, remember, you can actually watch us see our faces and watch our facial expressions so you know when we're making a joke based on our reactions. You can do that by going over to YouTube and searching <laughs> for the seventh rule. Anyway, let's get into this one. Sirach, I'm dying to know your initial reactions to this because all I remember about this episode is this girl's face. You know, when I saw that girl's face, I was yeah. like, oh yeah, and her cheeto long cheeto, <laughs> cheeto fingers. fingers uh yeah um i i i had some enjoyment watching this episode there were elements of it that i thought were good i like the idea of the crew um being concerned about wesley's well-being and giving him something to do that challenges him. Um, that is a, you know, a good way to build inner character kind of relationships and build on that. So that, I thought that was a good thing. I wasn't the biggest fan of uh, Picard and side of this hollow, sweet horseback oh, yeah. riding. I just felt like it didn't really fit the theme the narrative it didn't enhance the story it just seemed like some some extra added scenes that i didn't really necessarily need it didn't add anything to me and you know it's part of a long tradition it's turning into of star trek captains riding horses uh like kirk you know rode horses or at least he did in star trek generations the movie uh, Picard rides horses, and he continues to do so in later episodes, if I remember correctly, of The Next Generation. Uh, Captain Pike of Strange New Worlds, we know he likes to ride horses. Um, we know that Captain Sisko was like, get that thing away from me. Not, <laughs> <laughs> But there are a number of, I think Janeway even rode a horse in a holodeck, if I remember correctly. Correct us. In the comments below, everybody, let us know every character on Star Trek that was into horseback riding, which <laughs> ones were not. Um, but did you notice? Yeah, it, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, if it moved the story along, I would I would get it. And I didn't need to see him actually, you know, in that space. Also felt like that that was an untimely, hollow, sweet kind of vacation when you have these pervasive issues that are being dealt with. You have the planet near explosion and extermination of an entire, basically, civilization. Um, you've got this uh, first contact kind of, I mean, prime directive dilemma. Uh, it would seem that you would cut your horseback riding kind of thing short. That's well, you know, taking that a step further, you know what I noticed? At one point, they said, we've been in this system for six weeks. And I realized this is like a vacation for them. They're on this basically detached duty. You know, Starfleet probably just told them, okay, go check out this 
you know, whatever sector, what was the sector called? Saint Salkundi Drema. Drema. <laughs> Salkundi, Salkundi uh, Drema. Yeah. Yeah. Drema. Um, so they're there for six weeks just looking stuff over. They tell Wesley, they're like, all right, we're putting you in charge. But really what they're doing is saying, hey, we got a six week vacation. All right, kid, you uh, we're really counting on you. We're giving you this big responsibility. But really, they're just Picard. So I, I was like, is Picard horseback riding for six weeks? Is Riker <laughs> sitting in 10 forward and flirting with girls for six weeks? Are they just and then meanwhile, Wesley and the and the lower decker ensigns are working on this. They check in on them every <laughs> once in a while. That must have been their favorite mission ever. They're all just hanging out at the bar, having fun. Riker's like, I don't even know what day it is anymore. <laughs> so We're always talking about her kittens from back in the day. Whatever. That was yeah. Cool. That was um, the thing that I did like about the horseback riding and the whole equestrian theme was in the dialogue the way that they addressed the Arabic mythology behind horses and I thought that was a clever insert for uh, Melinda Snodgrass and Hannah to kind of put this extra layer of some meaning inside of the text um, Picard you know says something about the south wind and the mythology of the Arabian horse. Yeah. And that actually, yeah, that piqued my interest. I had to like look more into that and because I hadn't heard that before. And so when I did the mythology that he's referring to, and there are several of um, mythological connections to how the Arabian horse came to be. Um, but the one that, is being referred to in this particular story is um, this myth. Um, the, the, another creation of the myth puts the origin of the Arabian uh, horse in the time of Ishmael, the son of Abraham. So it's a biblical uh, reference um, from Ishmael, son of Abraham. And in, in that story, the angel Gabriel descended from heaven and awakened Ishmael with a wind spout that whirled toward him. The angel Gabriel then commanded the thundercloud to stop scattering dust and rain, and so it gathered itself into a prancing, handsome creature, a horse, that seemed to swallow up the ground. Hence the Bedouins bestowed the drinker of the wind to the first Arabian horse." And so that's the mythology that is being referred to in this episode. Other mythology, uh, Arabic, uh, Arabic mythology, also has biblical or kind of a um, religious origins. Uh, one of them being between Queen of Sheba and King Solomon. That that mm -hmm. the exchange of the horse was between them, and that's where the uh, first uh, domesticated. Uh, uh, Arabian horse comes from and then the other Arabian horse kind of origin story story um, relates back to Muhammad and him releasing some horses wild and the ones that came back to him were the ones that became the first line of the Arabian horse so interesting to know that the horse mythology the Arabian horse mythology has these religious origins specifically uh, the one being referred to here, which is a Old Testament story. And I just thought, clever, very clever, and allows me to kind of, as a thinker, to get something to chew on when I watch these kinds of episodes. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, now remember, Hannah Louise Shear, she was the writer that did, uh, that killed Denise Crosby's character, Tasha Yar. She wrote uh, Skin of Evil with Armis. Uh, Melinda M. Snodgrass famously wrote The Measure of a Man. So these two are combining mm -hmm. for this one. And I was noticing that Melinda is yet again credited in an episode in which something new is being introduced. Picard being a horse rider and taking the horse riding seriously because that comes up, you know, in, in subsequent episodes. And it's, you know, just like she did the poker and she did a few other things, you know, that we come to know as 
iconic Star Trek, iconic Next Generation, iconic Captain Picard. They were originally introduced back in these episodes by her. Uh, now, I don't know if that was her that wrote that part or if that was the story by with Hannah Louise Shear, but one of them did that. And it was funny that we suddenly get introduced. Oh, Picard likes to horse ride. Okay, that's cool. Then he starts doing this horse riding adage. Oh, wow, that's interesting. He's really into it. And then later on in a like a in a conference meeting, he starts saying, "Well, like any good horse rider, this horse." Ride. And I'm like, "All right, don't act <laughs> <All> like <right. laughs> don't act like you've been saying like like oh yeah, I, you know me. Every time we're in meetings, I'm always doing my horse riding metaphors and all that." And I was like, <laughs> suddenly, suddenly he's all about horses. It's kind of like if you got that friend that like they just take up skateboarding. And then three days later, he's like, oh, yeah, I got my Tony Hawk pro skateboard, you know, the, all this. And yeah. you're like, Don't act like you've been like skateboarding yeah. your whole life. I know you just started on Wednesday, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so Make me oh, think of that. Uh, yeah, you're right. It was a little bit over the top. I was waiting for him to do up. <laughs> but I want to uh, right highlight that. <laughs> he's probably did that uh, during his six weeks at Ted Forward. Yeah. Uh, but I, I have a question, um, something to add to what you were saying about the writing combination of Melinda Snodgrass and uh, Hannah Louise Shear. Um, you, you, you're right about those things that they give us these things that be, that last with us, you know, throughout the identity of the character, right? The uh, poker you said, and also this equestrian kind of background that Picard now has, and it, it will be something that you say will surface later. And another thing I want to add to that, which jumped out to me as well, was the T, Earl Grey, hot. If I'm not mistaken, that's something that they also um, yes. introduced in, in, into the lexicon. That's right. Was that in The Measure of a Man? But there was, a, there was an episode, and it was Melinda Snodgrass, I believe you're right, that did that. But then the T came out cold. Uh, right. But that was the first time that Picard did his iconic... T Earl Grey hot, uh, yes. yeah, she's which she he really did again is. in this episode. So she she inserts that. To, this is the second time to be yep. inserting that into an episode, right? So and like, both times, it, both times it was her, uh, mm -hmm. just like both of those episodes, The Measure of a Man and this one were episodes in which Data is being portrayed as more human. More so than any other episode, The Measure of a Man was fighting for his existence and as an individual. And in this one, he's breaking rules. He's making a friendship. He's saving a girl. He's doing sacrifices. Much more Data is much more human in those two episodes than he is in any other episode. So clearly, Melinda uh, Snodgrass has a particular shining towards data. She, it seems like she finds him to be the fascinating character that she wants to explore. I think, you know, Melinda has a, an idea that data is a great platform to kind of use for telling the stories of humanity that she's very good at telling, right? Uh, what, what are the kind of, um, what are the lines in which we observe humanity? And I think those are, she likes to deal with the lines of, of where the line is that we should cross or not cross. I think in Measure of a Man, one of the things was, you know, does Data have the right to decide whether he wants to be turned off for this procedure or whatnot, right? And so we were approaching the lines of where he has autonomy over his own mm -hmm. self. And in this particular episode, we're approaching the lines of what circumstances call for the breaking of protocol. And I think that was one of the things we're addressing in this issue, in this episode. Like, we have this primary, prime directive, but under what circumstances would we overrule the prime directive? And, and, and where is that line there that we can find, you know? And I think she's very good at trying to find these um, philosophical debates about gray area, where is those lines, uh, and also um, touching on the human emotions. She touched on human emotion with Picard when he saw uh, the kid. 
You know, there was a, or when he heard the kid's voice, there was a playing on the emotions there, you know? Yeah. Um, and I thought the same thing when they were in the observation lounge and they were kind of doing mental gymnastics to try to excuse breaking the prime directive. And it sounded very much like lawyering, you know, uh, which, you know, we know that uh, Melinda is and knows well. And so she writes what she knows. The first one was just flat out a courtroom drama. This one was not a courtroom drama, but there were these arguments being made that were similar. Uh, one was that great circular argument. And I think Riker even called it like a vicious circle where they're like, well, how can she ask for help if she doesn't know the person she's asking help from? And then Data says, well, she knows me, you know, and then I don't remember. Worf said something funny right there that cracked me up. Um, yeah, I did. He did. Um, if I could find it. But either way. Oh, yeah. So Worf it, says, it, he says, yeah. She cannot ask for help from someone she does not know. And then Data says, you know, she knows me. And the Riker says, what a perfectly vicious little circle. Um, but what was it? Oh, I can't find it. I'll have to find it later. Oh, yeah, that's what it was. No. It was right, it was right yeah. before that. Pulaski says, Data's friend is going to die. That means something. And Worf says, to Data. <laughs> I was like, you tell him, Worf. Oh, that yeah. Was, that was too good. Yeah, great, I like that. Great too. dialogue in this episode. To data, I did. I wrote that too. And I also wrote another line that I thought was great during that same exchange. It was um, delivered by LaForge. And I'm trying to find it, but he, he said, Oh, here it is. They were going about trying to decide in that conference room, you know, what to do about the prime directive and if the, if there was ways to you know get around it uh pulaski says after wharf says you know let it be just who cares about them we can't violate it pulaski says i find that to be something callous and cowardly yeah. or something right yeah i was waiting to see a close-up on wharf's response to that they didn't right. really give me the close-up i wanted yeah i actually rewound it to see his reaction but he didn't really do much but when she when she says, I find that to be he just says, you know, we got to follow the prime directive. It wasn't too crazy. And then she's yeah. like, I find that to be callous and even a little cowardly. I put in my notes. I was like, wow, calm the fuck down, Pulaski. <laughs> Yo, chill out. <laughs> Easy. Seriously, I'm just saying follow the rules. And you're, Let's you're begging talk on me. this out, man. Let's talk. This I was out. waiting for Worf to give a like a growl or some kind of something yeah. like what's up with what's your problem? Like, I yeah. don't get you. Yeah, that was. But like, they didn't she give took me it the, to eleven. Me. She went. She went yeah. from two to two to yeah. eleven. But Picard should be like, "Calm down, doctor. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> give yourself a sedative." Uh, yeah, and then and then and there was it was spicy in that conference room yeah. because I think Riker said something to the effect of like, "No, I think we should consider doing this." And and Jordy's like, "Considered it, considered and rejected." Yo. That was I nasty. Was like, Whoa, this dude dropped the bomb. And it, <laughs> because because Picard did say speak freely, right? So he did give everybody permission to speak freely. But I thought people took that speak freely way <laughs> to the next level. Pulaski's like, good, I could talk shit to Worf. I can <laughs> yeah, whatever. Jordy's going Jordy's like nuts. Jordy got what well, yeah, Jordy banged on number one. He, I thought I thought Riker was gonna say something because he says consider consider it considered and rejected i was like wow that was that was tough that was tough yeah. so yeah i did like that scene i did like them sitting in the conference room i thought the initial conference room scene when they're talking about wesley seemed a little forced to me just the way it was going around it was almost like they were talking about it in a comical way like they were trying to be comical about it hmm. when they first said i don't know if he can handle it well, maybe he can handle it. At first, I thought Wesley was in the room, right? And they're talking mm. about him while he's there and being like facetious. And, you know, when you're talking like somebody's there, like, do you think she can handle the job? Oh, like, I don't know. She'll have to try really yeah. hard and do a lot of chores. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, that that kind of talk. And I saw so I'm waiting to see Wesley in that scene because they delivered the lines the exact way you just said. I don't know. It'd be tough if he could really do it. So that's how you say talk when somebody's in the room and you're trying to do some kind of wordplay with them. So they say, well, no, I yeah. could do it. What are you talking about? But to talk like that when he's not in the room, it's like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't get the tone. It felt a little bit like for, we were back in the first season for a second there, you know, where they're all yeah. coming together to discuss Wesley and figure that out. And then, you know, they're giving him a teachable moment and all that. Uh, but before we get into all that, uh, I did want to point out Data a little bit more on the horse talk, on the horse play. Uh, <laughs> when Data goes into the holodeck, and, you know, to go see Picard. And he mm -hmm. says, excellent, <laughs> excellent steed, sir. I just thought, like, he seemed so awkward. And so excellent steeds. That sentence has never come out of it. It's never come out of my mouth. I had problems even saying. <laughs> and, then, and then he goes to pet the horse, and he looked like he just thought he was touching an alien. Like he was just like excellent. It's like you're not convincing anybody. You, I know that you are not comfortable with this beast in front of you. But anyway, I just thought that was like really funny. You know, you could tell Data was was angling to ask for something because you know when somebody's trying to be like oh that's really cool oh boy that's you know they're just trying to get in good yeah. and be like oh you know by the way while we're by the talking way. <laughs> i had a question yeah. no big deal i'm mostly here admiring your horse but also this other thing real quick <laughs> exactly yeah um yeah data had another moment like that to me in this episode that i wrote down in my notes i, I liked it when he was says you know computer search the profile for this and there's a look when he registers on his face, oh, it's the girl, uh, the, this and that, right? And that's the scene prior to him going to see Captain Picard. Like, because I think he says, uh, after he registers this look, he says, computer, where's Captain Picard? And he's like, he's on deck four or deck three. And he runs out of there and then they do a close up on uh, Wharf, right? Like, like, why did he just run out of here looking for Picard? Now, the reason I'm bringing that scene up is because I felt like, Brent Spiner, when he was looking at the computer screen and getting the information that, you know, this is somebody that he's been communicating with, he has to relay this information to Picard, all of that had to register on his facial expression. Mm -hmm. And I thought he did a great job in that moment on that close up with that facial expression that he had. And the reason I feel that way is because he was going to he started to play it a way a human would play it when they have those reactions. Yeah. And I, right. So a human would see it and say, Oh wow, this, I've been talking to a girl. It's this person that I've been talking to there, you know, this and that connecting the dots. I have to tell the captain, this is, this is a uh, prime directive issue, whatever, whatever. So a human would have to react to that in a human way. He caught himself and adjusted and did a kind of, robotic twist to the human reaction that you would normally have under those circumstances. And that's where I feel like Brent Spiner's acting with those knowledge that he's a robot and still having to main, uh, express human like emotions in a very subtle way, I think is, is remarkable on his part as far as a performance. That's a really good point. Hey, uh, we've got to get to our break very quickly, but everybody listening in right now, just be aware that we also have a second podcast, wherever you find podcasts, called The Seventh Rule 2, in which we uh, review all the new Star Trek series like Lower Decks, Picard, Strange New Worlds, Prodigy, Discovery, and everything new that's going to be coming out. You can find that, The Seventh Rule and The Number Two very easy to find. Go please check that out, subscribe to it, and uh, give it a five-star rating and a nice review. We really appreciate that. Now we're going to take a super quick break, and we will be right back on The Seventh Rule. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello. All right. We've got some trivioids this week for you, and they go a little something like this. 
The Enterprise is the first manned vessel to enter the Secundi Drama sector. At some point in the last 150 years, the fifth planet of the Sel- is it Secundi or Selkundi? I think it's Secundi. Selkundi, I think. Oh, Selkundi? Yeah. I don't know. Drama yeah. has shattered, mm-hmm. forming an asteroid belt. Captain Picard does not like small animals. Loxana Troy reacted badly to Deanna Troy's Betazoid kitten. Riker wants to put Wesley in charge of planetary mineral surveys. Dr. Pulaski thinks the senior staff is pushing Wesley too hard. She was so naggy. Uh, (laughs) Data is checking out the dips and peaks of the galaxy's magnetic field. And Ensign Davies likes to break up married teams. That little rascal Ensign Davies. Did you notice actually... How Davies was not really a jerk. But he gave a little pushback a couple times here and there. And then when when Wes comes in and says, I want you to do that thing, he said, consider it done. It's like, wait, what? Before he just finished saying, yeah, we probably shouldn't do it. So you would think that if Wes came in and said that, he would at least give a tiny pushback. Like, are you sure? Remember, blah, 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 blah. And then if Wes says, I'm sure, please get it done. Okay. But he was just like, he was like, I Wes walked in with authority. I can't hang. I'm just going to do it. He's intimidating. Yeah, um, he did say it with authority the second time around because he kind of said uh, he didn't leave any question there. And I think that's something could have been um, expanded upon in the conversation that Pulaski had with Wesley or maybe the one Riker had. I think they could have said to him, well, how did you suggest or ask him to do it you know and he said well I, I told him i i thought we should run a diagnostics on the whatever whatever and he said well you didn't instruct him you didn't give him a direct order you didn't say you know do a diagnostics he says i, I you know I, I told him i thought we should and i think there could have been a conversation about being assertive and um you know how to phrase being assertive like when picard gives an order he doesn't say well, i think you should go to warp speed you know what do, <laughs> what do you guys think <laughs> yeah so there could have been a conversation there for wesley to have an understanding no you can't suggest you have to demand right because you are the leader of this project and then i it. think you have to just say it right in a very matter of fact way leaving it open to question, like how I felt he did in the first time. Like, what do you think if we do a diagnostics and run isometric? And he's like, no, oh, bro, that took five hours. What are you kidding? Like, <laughs> yeah, I got to go know? to lunch, man. Come <laughs> yeah, on, we're on like, vacation. We're the only ones working on the ship for six weeks, man. Give us a second here. Uh, I did look it up uh, yeah. just to confirm. It is Selkundi drama. Uh, I had a Selkundi in one note and without the L in another. Tisk tisk. Yeah. But can we talk about the man of the hour, Chief Miles Edward O'Brien? It's so funny how I keep forgetting he's on this show. And then they just keep finding some excuse to have him on for a scene. Almost like, like they're really trying to force him in, shoehorn him in, you know, to an episode that really doesn't need him and i'm so happy that they did because they didn't need him in that episode but they keep cramming him in and it just it expands the cast which is great it also gets us the enjoyment of seeing him i'm looking it up here and this guy's in like almost every episode of the second season he's in maybe like 18 episodes uh which is insane. <laughs> he's 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 basically a, a regular. He's in almost every episode. He, he has the easiest dream job you could probably want to have because he only has like a one couple day, of lines. One day a week. <laughs> <laughs> one day. He gets a full episode's pay and he yeah. barely works. He's at about at 1 yeah. 30 that on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> But exactly. So uh, he has a, a dream job for an actor's uh, scenario. But I can also say he also has the terrible job for a Star Trek scenario. So he stays in that room all day waiting for somebody to get transported. Can you imagine the downtime on that? 
I, I mean, you'd be looking at your phone and you're playing yep. games. Like, there's got to be a lot of downtime because, uh, not you know, people are not getting beamed up every second. So what do you do? You're standing there. It's almost like, you know, uh, in the old days, you used to have a guy in the elevator who would press the button for you. Oh. And just do that. <laughs> it's like, it's like yeah. what floor are you going to, sir? You're like, bro, I could, I could close. The, I, I can press put, seven. Or, or the person <laughs> that hands you the the paper towel when you wash your hands in a yeah. public restroom i'm like yeah. i not only can i do it myself i want you to keep your hands off of my paper towel <laughs> when i just wash my hands i don't need your soiled <laughs> cuticles <laughs> uh, yeah my so it's freshly like, washed hands it, so that's what the job is like to me every time i see him in that job i'm like bro must have been standing there for 12 hours and he finally gets the job and he's like you know, you got to be on your feet too. They put a chair in there for the guy. At least it's high school. <laughs> yeah, you know, give him some sh- a nice little tree with shade. You know, it'd be There's funny no though. Chair in there. Is if they go in there and it happens, and every time it happens to be like the one two minute time that he goes off to the bathroom, and they're always just like, "Chief, where are you?" He's like, "Oh, I just went to the bathroom, sir." He's like, "That's what you said the last three times." I swear, it's just the t- I mean, imagine how annoyed he would be if every time he's just gone for two minutes yes. and that's when they show up and yeah, it makes him yeah. look bad but maybe he's just running diagnostics all day maybe that's why he became such a great chief engineer he's yeah. got all that downtime he's constantly pulling stuff apart and then when somebody walks in he like closes the, <laughs> the hatch real quick he's like yep everything's good sir you know <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, you would think they would automate that uh, little section there, right? It, uh, to 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 have a a man that needs to be there, it seems a little redundant usage of uh, manpower, right? You would think you could verbally just say uh, two to beam up, and it just boom takes you up there. Like <laughs> maybe it's hazing. Maybe they're like, you're going to be our transporter chief. <laughs> Whoa, chief? What does that mean? Chief? That means. That means you get to stay in transporter room three all day long because you're the chief of it. You, yes. You're you yes. say, okay. What is what else does it entail? Well, you stand there all day, and if we sometimes might need you once or twice a week, then you yeah. you push that button right here. This one, you push that yeah. button. You see the one that says beam. Yeah. Don't forget to push that button afterwards, though, when we ask you to come back. Don't mess it. You're the transporter chief. So we're really relying on you for this. Yeah, that's like a, that's such a such a redundant position. It seems so menial. But yeah. he had the scene of the episode. He did steal the episode with his scene yep. when um, Riker runs in there and he says, uh, you didn't see any of this or something. Mm-hmm. What does he say to him? He uh, said, let's see if I can find it. He said, O'Brien, oh, take a nap. You didn't see any of this. You're not involved. Boom. Just cut to the chase. And O'Brien yeah. says, O'Brien says, right, sir. I'll just be standing here dozing off. <laughs> like, yes. You got to love the yeah. guy. Great line. Great delivery. And then, of course, the yeah. first thing you think when Data says two to beam up, I'm thinking, ooh, you're going to try to get transporter chief in trouble. Riker was like, you didn't see anything. You're not involved. And then when Riker leaves, he gets called to the bridge. He says, you know what to do, right? And he's like, oh, yeah, I got it. First thing he does, beams two people. That's not what yeah. you're supposed to do, Chief. You had <laughs> one job. And they barely hey, trusted he didn't see you anything. that one job. And he still, he <laughs> he's like, I brought he's data back sleep. and a little orange thing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, he got so thrown. It was so great when he says, I'll just be over here We're taking a nap. I, I just love that one. That was, mm-hmm. that was great. Um, even another thing that I really liked watching this episode was the back and forth between Picard and Riker. When Reich, uh, Picard says, number one, you know where we are now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then Riker says, where are we now, sir? And he's like, up, on, uh, up to his forehead. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then they did do a uh, kind of a remaining shot after Picard did like, up to the forehead they did a close-up on picard after that and i love the look of concern on his face like damn this is getting worse and we're just keep digging in a deeper hole it's not getting better what about yeah here was something that i thought was interesting 
first of all, it was hilarious when Picard says, you know, Data brought a child onto my ship, yeah. onto my bridge. And Riker says, I'm sure Mr. Data has a very good explanation. And Data goes, she was frightened and she wanted to. He's like, <laughs> Mr. Data, will you man your station? I was like, oh, you're in trouble, yeah. Data. But then when he said he's brought a child, my first thought was, how does he know it's a child? Could just be a short alien. You know? Yeah. That you know yeah. that would be that would be a terrible first contact if you say why'd you bring a child and they go this is the planet's elder Do you, don't <laughs> I'm not a child yeah what a faux pas <laughs> come on yeah um, the child uh, you know I understand it's a child and then you got to put all the makeup on them I think they did a good job this child actor actor did a good job at. Uh, mm -hmm you know, trying to perform with all that makeup. It was, it's always sweet to have a, you know, Data? A, yo a young actor in there. <laughs> Data. Um, I did like the line that Picard gave to Wesley, because I, I do think that when you're, you know, building character and helping, encouraging a young ensign who's trying to work his way up, uh, you need kind of these conversations to happen in order to, build some self-confidence for the young guy. So I did like when Picard said to him, I respect an officer who is prepared to admit ignorance and ask a question. Yeah. Rather than one who uh, <clears throat> out of pride will blunder blindly forward. And <clears throat> I thought that was a great piece of advice, even for any young person out there or for anybody out there. Um, it's okay to admit ignorance and ask questions because that actually shows your curiosity. It shows your honesty. It shows um, that you're it's, willing to, your willingness to learn. And it's a confidence uh, thing. Pretending like you know things already. Yeah, yeah, it's confidence. It's like I've always thought one of the most empowering things is to, and respectful things, respectful things is to say, I don't know. You know, yeah. a lot of people have a tendency to try to, fake it or pretend like they know something that they don't say i don't know it's okay and you know he's giving you know west this this very young officer that advice of like look i know that you're going to be trying to prove yourself to them and probably one of the first mistakes somebody in your position would make is to try to act like you know more than you do or you're better than you are just you're in charge you have the authority you don't have to act any particular way. Yeah, you're right. It was, it was a good piece of advice. Yeah. Um, something that I try to live by myself. Um, I try to ask as many questions as I can, especially when I don't know something about something. I think that's the way you learn. <laughs> and then you can move past that moment of not knowing in a, a sensible way. But I, I did like that advice. Also like um, Pulaski telling uh, Wesley about authority and confidence. Yeah, I liked when Riker was talking about the responsibility of authority and what it entailed. You know, he had a responsibility. Uh, so those were good life lessons. I thought good ways to steer young Wesley into uh, proper development, give him a, a challenge, give him a task, also let him kind of prove his leadership skills. So for that purpose, I did like the uh, the B story, I guess you would say, on this episode. Yeah, when Picard says uh, to Riker, he says, in for a penny, in for a pound. Now, I've never heard that saying before, but it sounds like it's basically saying, look, you know, if you're, I guess it's obvious, if you're in for a penny, you might as well go in all the way. Just go for it all the way. It's good saying. It's Right now, all the British people listening in are like, you've never heard. In for a penny, in for a pound. <laughs> Americans are so stupid, but it's true. I hadn't, I hadn't heard one, that one, but it makes sense. Like as soon as you hear it, you understand what the saying must be, or maybe it's not a saying. Maybe he just made it up for that episode, but it sounds like it is. Uh, yeah, it was a funny line that kind of stood out to me, I, and it probably didn't. It's probably meaningless, but it just was a small thing. The um, Wesley says, hey, can I walk with you guys and ask you for some advice? And Riker says, sure, it's free. 
Uh, he's like, which one? He says, walking and advice are free or something to that effect, right? But that joke resonates with me in the present day in where money is a realistic part of our life, right? We all mm -hmm. live in a day-to-day -day existence where we navigate a existence with money. You know, we need it for our needs, our bills, our food, our, our existence. In this utopian future that's been created, money does not have the same relevance. And so when somebody says, hey, can I ask you a question? You say, you say yeah, okay. you, you know, it's free. Everything's free. Like, yeah. that doesn't, right? Like, the, the reality that we live in, everything is free, right? I mean, so that statement is a statement that's relative to the times in which we live in where money has this essential factor of our daily lives not into this utopia that joke doesn't resonate into a star trek crew might be that's true that's true it's kind of like if they go hey i'll bet you 10 bucks that that guy walks through that door and they'll be like <laughs> what? what i can just replicate right. 10 bucks i don't care uh yeah. but here's something interesting so i just googled in for a penny, in for a pound, just for fun, obviously. And you'll never guess what it says. First thing, this is brilliant. It says, used to express someone's intention to complete an enterprise <laughs> once it has been undertaken, however much time, effort, or money this entails. So of course, yeah, it definitely means exactly what we assumed it would mean, but it's just funny that to complete an yes. enterprise, I was like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, that was... That's delivered, I'm pretty sure. Somebody in there knows. In for a um, penny, in for a pound. <laughs> <laughs> I also thought that when they found a, a, a planet full of dilithium crystals, that that is a fuel source for their warp engines. And I thought they had mined dilithium. I thought that would be a, a topic that they would also bring up, like, oh, maybe yeah. we have to intervene because this dilithium could be beneficial to Starfleet and therefore it, it raises a need worthy of us intervening. So I, I thought they could have used that as a, also a plot line kind of hinge piece, you know? You know, I have a couple, uh, a couple more things to say very quickly. One is um, that when they arrived at the second planet, maybe 15 minutes in, um, for some reason, it just hit me that when they're arriving at the second planet, they're like, we've arrived at the second Sekundi, whatever, Selkundi system. My first thought was, right here, this is where Sirach's losing interest. <laughs> I, I, just, I just had this, this impression of it's just going to be an episode of like, you know, talking and going from planet to planet um i don't know if you did or not but that was just a a funny thing that i thought and the other <laughs> thing was why was it so dark in the observation lounge where they all had their meeting their conference room mm -hmm. it was just mm -hmm. really dark and i don't know what's going on there if that's deliberate but i just uh, kind of i noticed that surprise. too and i've actually noticed it before mm -hmm. and um I've seen that same thing play out and I, it, it makes me wonder if they hadn't figured out how to rig the lights based on the fact that that uh, half of the wall is the space backdrop and you can't have lights coming oh, from that cause, angle because then it would like it might reflect off the curtain and you could see the curtain maybe yes. Interesting. Yeah, so I've always wondered why, because I've noticed this now multiple times when they meet in that room. It's super dark, yeah. and I'm like, well, well, why aren't they lighting this better? Maybe Picard uh, wants it to be romantic. He's like, yeah, <laughs> step into. I do not yeah. understand, Captain, why you have it so dark. And then Riker's like, come over here, Worf. Hey, uh, I think it's time for the home run of the day, right? <laughs> Before we get any crazier. Who do you yeah. think deserves the home run, the seventh rule home run of the episode? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to say, yeah, this is, 
I'm going to say that uh, Data gets the uh, home run for this. Brent Spiner, I thought he did a great job. Like I said, I mentioned that look on his face. He's able to carry these episodes with his curiosity, with his uh, dialogue. Um, yeah, I'm going to say Data carried this episode once again. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go with Chief Miles Edward O'Brien. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, I mean, because, you know, he kind of stole the show in a bit. And it's just amazing that he's getting such a good gig of just being kind of shoehorned into an episode that doesn't need him, but it's just a bonus. It's just great. We're happy to see him. Um, They didn't realize how happy we'd be to see him later on because they, you know, he became a regular and a very beloved regular in the next series, uh, Deep Space Nine. So now when we go back and watch this, we're like, yay, we got some Deep Space Nine (laughs) here. And it's super fun. And also the uh the other one goes to the uh beautiful steed or what was it magnificent steed i don't remember <laughs> whatever data called him yeah all yeah. uncomfortably i also um, want to give honorary mention to uh melinda snodgrass honorary home runs for melinda and hannah louise Shear. totally um you know they've been very nice to us and um mm-hmm. i like the way they layer their writing with certain themes that question you know philosophical uh, points of view. Great dialogue. Great dialogue f- to give us good character development. We're, they're, get, they're giving the actors something good to flesh out their characters with. Not just scientific mumbo jumbo, but, but good dialogue. Um, yeah. Speaking Picard's of good dialogue. One line, uh, oh, I'm sorry. But I wanted to throw one. Picard says, uh, if it weren't a geological calamity, if it were an epidemic, that and was Dr. great. Glass, says, yes. And he says, what about war? And he, what he about was... just an oppressive government? You know, because then then it's yeah. kind of like, it's like if you don't have a hard line that nobody crosses, yes. then where that line goes becomes subjective. Then it's like, what about an oppressive government? Well, I guess we should intervene if it's a, what about if there's just a fire? What about if there's just over taxation? <laughs> you know, like where, where you know, because some people might be like, yeah. well, over taxation is really bad. We should save them. And then, well, what about if they just have unhealthy candy that they're eating too much? Well, that, that, you know, like, where's that? Yeah. Like, you're right. Where's that was the really smart. Really smart. Very good. That's why that's why I think Melinda <laughs> and Hannah really gave us some good uh, dialogue there to question how we think and perceive things, why there are hard lines and why there's also exceptions. So it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's good to think about. Speaking of exceptions, these people are exceptional, and their names are Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom TJ, Jackson Bay, Bill, Victor Arukin, Arukin, Titus Muller, Darlena Marie, Dr. Mohammed Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anna Post, Anil O. Palat, the Traveler. Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, DQ, Justine Norton Kurtzen, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, My Live from Tokyo, The Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Jane Jorgensen, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Julie Manosfi, Marsha Classic Schreier, Greg K. Wickstrom, Dr. Susan V. Gruner, and Jason, the outrageous, that is, Oaken. All right, everybody, <laughs> stick around. We've got the free-for-all coming up next. It's going to be nuts. We'll be right back on the <laughs> seventh rule. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the seventh rule. This is the free-for-all. You know it. You love it. Sirach Lofton, of course, is here. I myself am here. I'm Ryan. <laughs> Melissa Longo, thankfully, finally has returned. Hi there, folks. <laughs> Eve England is here. She's got an isolinear chip on her shirt, which is pretty awesome. You can get that at the Seventh Rule store. Uh, Mai is live in Tokyo, if you can believe that. Chris McGee's got his stem bolt and chill shirt. Dr. Susan V. Gruner is here. She's also got a Seventh Rule shirt. Pretty radical. Uh, Jason the Outrageous Oaken with his awesome background and some kind of shirt. I feel like I can... Oh, it's a Picard face palm. Pretty cool. Uh, Gregory K. Wickstrom has his Bozeman Phoenixes shirt. That's his favorite sports ball team. Faith Howell is here with a sinister sneer. 
Carrie Schwent is hanging out in front of a tree and Allison Leach Hyde is wearing the awesome shirt by the Abyssinian kiosk. There it is. All right, first things first, Jake Sisko guesses the IMDb score. Mm, I'm going to say this is like a 6.8. Interesting. Anybody else have any guesses that are equally far off? Oh, so <laughs> <laughs> what do you think it is? I think it's 7.2. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say the, that exact same I, it's, thing. Oh, it has to be over 7. It doesn't have to be, but I think it's over seven. <laughs> <laughs> well, the answer is the winner of the Ciroc Lofton Award today is Ciroc Lofton. It is a 6.8. Oh. Wow. Oh, oh, wow. So... <laughs> Boom. Got well him. done. <laughs> Got him. <Nice. laughs> All right. Uh, also, there was a non appearance mention today, if I remember correctly. Did anybody get that? Uh, Hmm. It has to do with the kitty. What do you got, Allison? Looks like you got it. Oh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Deanna's mom, Waxana Troy, getting some love, not by the kitty, but by her daughter. <laughs> All right. Melissa Longo, will you please get us started on the right track? What'd you think of this episode? <laughs> Um, uh, I didn't hate this episode at all. Uh, <laughs> the things that I liked about this episode is that it, it's, I like that season two, we're getting to explore more of the day-to-day -day relationships and see the day-to-day -day, um, life of the crew. And I like seeing that and I like seeing the interactions between um, different people and how those interactions reveal relationship or character as well as relationship. Um, <laughs> but, and, and I think that the boardroom um, scenes worked for me because um, they, they reveal the complexities and the moral and philosophical variances between characters and and because of their past experiences, they approach a certain dilemma from a, a different point of view. So I liked that. Um, I th also thought it was interesting that Pulaski was the one who was defending data above everyone else. I, I like to see that growth from her character and um, her embracing data as a sentient being rather than just a, a machine whose feelings don't matter. Um, and it was quite the opposite in this episode. Um, I was surprised at the lack of curiosity about Sargenta and her species from the rest of the crew, um, aside from the android and the hard ass, Pulaski. Everyone else seemed to, um, to not be nearly as curious about her as as data was so yeah and i just thought it was interesting that data above everyone else the android had more compassion for this child than everyone else seemed to have mm -hmm. good point thanks very much melissa longo <laughs> Now, Eve England is out in Wales. She's never watched The Next Generation. We're just dying to know what she thought about this episode. Yeah, I, what you just said, Melissa, that I, they were exactly some of the points that I sort of that jumped out at me when I was watching it. Again, I didn't hate it. I didn't absolutely love it, but there were lots of aspects to it that I did really enjoy and was sort of quite gripped by. I think the that, that scene where they were all discussing what to do and the fact that they weren't in the usual boardroom and I'm sure um, Jason will come on to sort of the way it was shot, but there was definitely something really gripping about the way that they presented that and that the fact that they let them argue and have this conflict, which we don't usually get to see, you know, it got quite personal at times. You could see, as Manisa said, the characters of each of the, um, you know, their actual individual 
nature coming through via those arguments. Um, so I thought that was done really well. And that was, like I said, totally gripped by that scene. Um, again, I love what I did like about, I did like the synergy that we had between the A and the B plot in terms of, you very much got the sense that both Wes and Data were kind of growing up in this episode and you had, you know, Wes going through building up his confidence, but then you had Data sort of exploring his humanity, his emotions, particularly on the sort of empathetic side as well. So I, I did like how they put those two stories together in, in parallel. Um, what I did find really interesting, though, is, you know, you had all these conversations about, you know, whether what they were doing was right and whether they should interfere and all this f philosophical questions. But then at the end, I I found it really uncomfortable that they decided that they were just going to wipe her mind and her memories. It just felt to me quite insidious and quite dark that that was just a convenience for them to make themselves feel better and to get themselves out of it. A sticky situation that they found themselves in and I just thought that was sort of a little bit telling of the Federation and Starfleet and how they kind of everything is 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 their narrative and how they you know put everything into that box so that it nicely fits in with with what they're trying to achieve so I thought that was a really interesting commentary at the end and I like the fact that Pulaski and Data kind of challenged that but they, I would like to have seen more of that. I thought that was really interesting. Um, and then just finally, just Melissa's background has reminded me, I really loved that set. It just, mm -hmm. I loved the sort of, it, it felt to me very sort of London brutalism architecture style. So very concrete and mm -hmm. very sort of muted tones. And I just thought that was, I just thought that was really beautiful the way that they did that. Um, and with the costume and everything, that, that sort of had a really good artistic feel to it. Um, so yeah, so overall I was, um, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I, I, there were a few bits that I didn't enjoy, but I think overall it was a pretty solid episode. Good stuff. Thanks very much. Uh, good point. Now for the rest of Star Trek ever, we can break the uh, Prime Directive and just wipe their memory, right? Just get one of those men in black things and right? you're all ah. set. Uh, look, what I'm trying to say <laughs> is that Mai is live in Tokyo. What do you think of this episode, Mai? I got a question for people that are far brighter than I am. Why, if Picard's office is off the bridge, are the stars um, out of his window going away from the ship? Wouldn't he be at the front somewhere? I, I, I didn't quite understand that. That, that made no, the, the, the stars just keep going backwards away from him. So unless his office is at the back of this huge saucer section, it would seem that they would he would see stars going sideways to the ship. I wasn't quite sure what was happening there. So anyway, the other thing, I don't know if you guys have ever um, had Japanese uh, spider crab. It's like as popular here as Dungeness is in San Francisco. Um, but the, looking at the the background for what Jason's got, the, the hand on, on Sarjenka, it, it definitely looks like a Japanese spider crab. I was like, what? So anyway, that was, <laughs> that was kind of curious. Um, coming back to this, I think the best thing I can do here is give a quote, which says, you are the sum total of everything you've ever seen, heard, eaten, smelled, been told, forgot. It's all there. Everything influences each of us. And because of that, I try to make sure that my experiences are positive. That was Maya Angelou in 2011. And she's got so many great quotes. But that one I thought was interesting because by this definition, Data is more human than he was before encountering Sarjenka. And he was changed by the first message. He was further changed by subsequent messages. Um, and ultimately, he realized his growth. And we as the audience realize his growth when he notes that she will not remember him, but he'll remember her. Um, I thought Picard's suggestion that he's a step closer to understanding humanity is interesting. Is it only humans who have memories? I mean, if we are all human and otherwise made up of these memories and experiences, my, as Maya Angelou suggests, I think in my very best data voice, I would have to ask, does not data qualify as we all do? That was a very good data voice. All right. <laughs> the second best data voice of all, everybody knows, is Chris McGee. What's up, Chris McGee? What did you think of this episode? I will not be testing out that voice today. Sorry. <laughs> so to uh, echo what uh, uh, my uh, the, the hand, hand on Sarchenka, I thought was really interesting. Unlike a human's where the ring finger and the pinky finger kind of get shorter, hers get longer. And I thought that was 
it's kind of an interesting uh, design choice there. I'd like that. Um, I got a couple of interesting things to point out. Uh, I don't know. I doubt it was intentional at the time, but I think that opening scene speaks to Picard's love of horses, even ones that aren't real. Um, for example, after being called to the bridge, he could have just, you know, called for the exit and walked off the holodeck. Instead, he begins to tie the horse back up, even though it's just a hologram. And uh, this this affection for horses just might be seen in the future, too. The big thing, though, that I noticed in this, and it, I, I find the B plot of this episode, which I'm, I, I'm uh, calling the Sarjenka story the A plot, because after all, the episode is titled Pen Pals. So I'm calling the B plot the Wesley uh, one. And I find that more interesting to me than the A plot. And it's played out in my head many times over the years, and it actually has helped me greatly in my life and career. If I can diverge from Star Trek for just a few moments here, my re career has uh, recently gone through some significant changes uh, and only so late in my life. Uh, for many years, I was a graphic designer, always the lowest man on the totem pole from employer to employer. And being that low man on the totem pole, I've kind of learned that even when I disagreed with orders that were given to me, I just had to be like, had, had to learn when to be like Ensign Davies and just smile and say, you got it, even if I didn't like the choice. Well, I recently dove into programming, relatively recently, became a software engineer. So I was shifting careers entirely, also shifted to a new city. And just this year, in fact, in fact got promoted to a senior software engineer, um, where I now help mentor new hires and interns. Um, so I'm sure you, you know, I don't see where this is going. I often suffer from imposter syndrome, which I'm sure everyone here probably knows about and maybe even feels to some degree at least. Um, and I think this plot with Wesley deals with it pretty well, especially during the scene in the corridor with Dr. Pulaski and later on, the scene with Riker and Tin Forward, you know, where he says, I, every time I give an order, something inside me says, what makes my judgment so superior to these people? I mean, that's textbook imposter syndrome right there. And of course, later, what if I'm wrong? Well, then you're wrong. Own it. That's my philosophy. As well. In fact, that, I, I think that's part of being an adult is just make your, you make your mistakes and you just do what you can to own them up and do what you can to correct them and not make them again. That's it. Um, last thing, uh, not to step on um, Jason's toes here, but the little nitpick I found was, is it me or are some of the close-ups in this episode focused a little bit incorrectly? I mean, at least in HD, I can definitely see, like on the close-up on Riker or Picard, I can see their ears more than their eyes a little bit more clearly anyway. Hmm. Um, finally, of course, the quote of the episode, there are quite a few. My favorite, the one that stuck with me is what a perfectly vicious little circle. Yes. Great one. All right. No stranger to perfectly vicious circles. Dr. Susan B. Gruner. What's up, Sue? What did you think of this episode? Well, I agree with pretty much everything everybody said. Um, you, you all stole all my notes. <laughs> so um, I l tend to like data-centric episodes, and I really like seeing him grow as a, as a sort of a human. But he, I think it was, was it Melissa? Or somebody pointed out that he was the most human. In this episode, he really was. He was holding her hand and... Uh, Sarjenka was hid behind him when she was afraid. I thought that was just so great for Brent Spiner to play him like that. I also thought, uh, I wrote down that I thought, well, Will Wheaton did a great job too. He's just growing so much. And we're starting to, the cast is finally starting to gel, I think, a little bit. I know I keep saying that, but uh, they really are. The only nitpick I had with this episode and I, I, by the way, I love the set. I love Sarjenka's room. I think that was her little room. I loved her the sparkles in her hair. 
uh, was O'Brien calling her it oh. after she was beamed aboard the ship. I thought, wow, that's so unlike O'Brien to do that. If he didn't know if it, if they, he, she, she, he could have just said they. And that he said it, I thought, was so unworthy of the O'Brien character. Just to use such a term to describe a, a person. Interesting. Yes, yeah, Rock and I. Maybe, yeah, we didn't cover that, but maybe he thought she was Cardassian because he does hate Cardassians, right? In the yes. See? Cardi, bloody Cardi. Cardassians. <laughs> and the no Cardassians. <laughs> uh, what did you say? What, Melissa? Where's what the is, spoon? <laughs> that is very derogatory. <laughs> oh, and I love Pulaski too. I love her and I love Gates. The, I just, I guess we just can't have them both. Nope. But if we could, it would be Jason Oaken that would tell us how it was possible. <laughs> uh, what did you think of this episode, Jason? Well, anything is possible. I mean, I, honestly, I think the episode is cute. I always had a soft spot for it. I mean, obviously, it's not without its warts. Uh, uh, one thing I will say, it's a pretty good-looking episode. And sometimes you have to go back and take a look at, you know, whose typewriter it came from and, you know, who directed the episode. And Melinda Snodgrass knows how to write a script. I mean, obviously, you know, measure of a man. And, you know, the fact that she picked data to be the central point of the story isn't surprising at all because, you know, because of you know her points of view so uh, everything looks and, and feels personal and you know from what i understand you know the script was neutered quite a bit in terms of its interpersonal relationships and, and you do feel certain things are missing and get a little bit techy but that's you know beside the point in terms of the look you know what i sometimes experience and i try not to look at who the director is until later but sometimes especially you know as you start watching it caesar you can have sort of two opposite reactions one is who directed that or who directed that and uh, you can see from the first shot that this this looked great and i know you know maybe rick colby wasn't as pleased with this as he could have been but certainly he did a lot with what he had i mean if you look at the uh at the blocking and the shot selection anything from you know tracking shots rock focus you know low angles even you know uh when uh, riker's talking to wesley uh, and then get into the sort of a personal conversation you get you get to these close-ups, almost extreme close-ups. Um, so you get sort of inside sort of their minds. I mean, in one place you have three or four characters in the frame, and they're positioned to such a degree and so well that number one is he didn't really use a long lens, and number two they weren't that close together. So and, and you know the staging, the blocking, even you know to some degree, even even the lighting in some scenes was it was terrific. I mean, uh, take a look at you know and. Uh, yeah, you, know, uh, you said if you look at the sort of this conference, the current quarters, because I guess it wasn't an official conference. That's why you wouldn't have it in the uh, observation lounge because of the, I guess, uh, the sensitivity of uh, the subject matter. But you see everybody sitting in Wharf is standing very stiff. I mean, this is something that, you know, reflects all the characters. I mean, somebody had to play some like that. So little details. I mean, uh, Typically, what you have in the whole in in the corridor, you have a walk and talk. You have basically a dollar shot of people kind of walking, and the camera kind of tracks with them. Here, for a couple of these scenes, you have a camera stationary, and you sort of you see characters coming to you. The camera turns, and they walk away from you. I mean, it's probably easier to set up, but it's just something that's a little bit unusual. You don't see this very often on Star Trek. I'm just trying to remember who else used something like this, and I you know, and I really can. So there there are some things that make it look good. Um, there, there, there are a lot more things I can say, and I'll save them for later. But uh, there's a certain amount of enjoyment in seeing something that actually is very pleasing to the eye. And when the story is flowing and the, and the characters are sort of explored, at least to some degree, when it comes to the second season, it's it's, it's certainly a, a, a nice addition. Again, overall, you know, if you look at the entire series and everything else, maybe that's not uh, the highlight of it all. But I think for the second season, that's uh, one of the better ones. Very good. Thank you so much, Jason Oaken. Uh, Gregory K. Wickstrom, uh, this episode was cute. Your thoughts? It was cute, <laughs> I have to say. You know, I try to go by the feeling that I get from an episode, as well as, like, the logic of it. Um, and it kind of depends what mood I'm in, but this one, it hit me. And I love that. I want to say that it's a low-stakes episode, relatively, 
You know what I mean? Like, it's not saving an entire planet or, like, millions of people. We're saving a single girl, but it, it feels like we're, you know, just as important as saving an entire planet, you know? Like, to me, at least. And it seemed like that to the crew. Um, it felt like a very prime directive centric episode. Like that was at its core, I think. And it had the two basic arguments, you know, for and against the prime directive. I was, I was going to say more, but Melissa and Eve pretty much said exactly what I was going to say. So I'll save that for, uh, after we can skip mm -hmm. that. But I want to go over the, those two points of the prime directive. So Troy's is saying, isn't it a possibility that we are a part of the fate of this planet or this person? And Jordy says it could be a part of the plan that we interfere, right? But then Rick Riker's response says, well, that eliminates the possibility of fate, right? And I think, well, no, that's the definition of fate. You know, fate doesn't stop at the planet level. Shouldn't it go beyond to like, everything in that galaxy you know like why should fate be confined to the planet like that's my opinion on the prime directive um i think there could be addendums to it but i know that's gonna upset a ton of star trek fans like <laughs> war is off the table you know what i mean but you know there's what's the harm in uh interfering ge geologically stuff like that picard says it's to protect themselves the crew themselves the prime directive is there to protect themselves more than it is to protect other species and i think that's a really important um, aspect because humans care so much like not just now but in the future that we need our prime directive to tell us hey we we gotta back off you know if we interfere then things can go badly for that planet. But yeah, I'll pass it on to the next person. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, Faith Howell has a big smile. She totally agrees with what you said. What do you think of this episode? So I really loved this episode when I was little. Um, you know, obviously I see myself through the eyes of Sarjenka and... <laughs> I totally wanted Data to be my big brother and rescue me from whatever was going on at that time and take me to the Enterprise. So um, this is one of my most memorable episodes. I won't necessarily call it my favorite because, of course, as I've grown, like it's a little bit stressful to think about your whole planet falling apart around you and what on earth your family would do. So um, I kind of go back and forth on whether I, I truly enjoy this episode or not. But uh, watching it this time, I definitely enjoyed the that sci-fi discussion of, you know, the prime directive, is it good or is it not good for us? And I love that idea of it really is most difficult uh, when we know the people. It's easy to follow the prime directive if it's just a planet full of people we don't know or, you know, aliens because there were other at that point and they're not part of us but once we've made contact and we know them it becomes really hard not to help and not to get involved and i love that idea i think that that cuts to the core of humanity in general because you know that's equal parts what's good about the world and what's wrong with the world if we know people and we take the time to get to know them I've never met anybody that was truly bad. It's just, you didn't know them yet. You didn't understand what their motivations were and why they were acting that way. So um, I, I really liked that, that piece. I thought there were also a couple of other um, good one-liners that kind of were thought provoking um, at the beginning. Um, Picard says animals fill spaces you never knew were empty. I really liked that, that thought. Um, you can't guide someone into adulthood. Um, yeah. And then my friend was troubled. I had to help. My favorites. Excellent. Thank you very much, Faith Howell. Uh, Carrie Schwent is here, but knows her as Crafty Bear. What's up, Carrie? What'd you think of this episode? I really, really like this episode for so many reasons. I have way too many notes. I'll save a chunk of them for 
for for afterwards, but I love the the horses. I thought that that white horse was just gorgeous. I've only been able to actually go horseback riding a couple of times, but I've loved it every every time I have. I think horses are beautiful, and uh, yeah, I had to had, had to had to dress up a little bit a little bit like like Picard with his jaunty hat jaunty hat, and I liked his outfit. It was I thought it was very very cute. I also thought Sir yeah Sir Jenkins' bedroom was very very cute, and because I like to look at stuff in the background, did anybody else notice that insanely creepy? Cabbage Patch looking doll on her on her mm -hmm. bed. Yeah. That thing was nightmare fuel. It was, and when you got closer to it, it was even bigger than it looked at first. Too, I don't know how she slept with that thing. It was creepy. Mm -hmm. I saw a cool the... bouncy ball. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, and the the line about the the Arab legend that Picard says, and then Troy's response to it. That line that line makes Eric cringe, but I love it because it's it's true. It after after a fashion, it is kind of true. The scene with Ober with O'Brien when they when da when data goes back down when oh yeah, okay. I'm just gonna go to sleep over here over here against the wall. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I'm awake I'm awake now. Mm -hmm. Probably the single funniest O'Brien scene so far. Absolutely, absolutely hysterical. Oh, let's see. Yeah, got that, yeah, got that, got that, got that. Okay, but the the remainder the remainder of the time, I very much related, kind of like Chris did to. I mean, I I love was it we know I love was it was it Crusher and his his whole his whole arc in, in the episode, I very much related to. It's never easy when you're put in charge, especially people you don't really maybe even know. May or who may or may not be older older than you, and the kind of un, unsettling feeling that 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 causes. When he walked in walked into the room and sees all these adults sitting sitting around a table just staring at him, he, he sort of stops and is a like gulp before he asks what what's going on. And I loved Pic what That's Picard funny. said to him about it's okay to ask questions. It's but yeah better better to ask the questions than not and then make a mistake. And I've also been in the in Wesley's position where you're trying to get somebody to do, to do something. They're like, "No, I don't really want to do that." I was very much related to him there because I I'm I'm the type that I kind of back off pretty quick in situations like that. So I definitely know what he what he was what he was thinking there, but that 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 sort of sort of thinking. Let, led to the ins inspiration for this episode's poem. So here we go. Leadership skills are learned as we go. It's hard to admit the things we don't know. Decisions big and small might not seem like much at all, but they'll add up so in the end we grow. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Carrie. I couldn't help but notice Chris doing the Bajoran clap there. Very cool. Uh, <laughs> Allison Leach Hyde is here. What is up, Allison? Cool earrings. What do you think of this episode? Thank you. You know, I guess I'm going to be the dissenting voice in this one. I've never liked this episode. It always, I like the character development, I guess, you know, seeing the relationships, but like the plot oh, it felt disjointed or not fully realized like we never got true drama or true comedy we were like we'd go up the hill and then it just we never got far up it, it like it just it was molehills we we're gonna go up some mountains but they just kept turning into molehills that's how I've always felt about this episode and maybe it's because of the music is weirdly placed a lot for me it felt like it was like missing the first half of the episode. And then we get great music in the scene where we're all in Picard's suite, I guess. And, you know, we're talking about the prime directive and Picard changes his mind when he hears her voice and goes, oh, this is a child. Like, OK, 
I can't, I can't not help a child. I mean, I may not like kids, but I, I'm not going to let one die. So, you know, I thought it was used well there, but I, I've never liked the episode, but I want to give Nikki Cox, the little girl, some major kudos because she played through one hell of a mask of makeup and I thought she did a wonderful job and yeah I know they tweaked her voice to make it sound different but I thought she did a lovely job emoting through that amount of makeup and and her hands and not being able to really touch Brent because it would turn him orange (laughs) and so I thought she did a fabulous job in this episode and I always enjoy seeing you know O'Brien be our comic relief so great to have more of him and I also really liked Worf tripping over all of Data's debris <laughs> on the bridge. You know, like I like that, but overall, I tend to skip this episode on rewatches. So, all right, great stuff. Keeping it real, uh, Sirach Lofton. What's Jake's final take? Uh, I got a couple little snapshots. One, when Wesley was with his crew of people that he assembled one of them was a black dude and it seemed like he had a high top and i, yes. I, I the, the camera went past him really quickly but i was like wait a minute a little uh, high top action back in the day got caught on camera so i guess he was the married guy that was part of the team or whatever but i'm not sure they didn't really give him any lines and but i did see him um the other thing i was going to bring up was I thought it was sweet when the girl that was in this, the uh, Nikki Cox, when when she told Data that she stayed behind to wait for him, uh, because she didn't want you know not someone not to be there, like there wasn't somebody there for her, or something to that effect. And I thought that was a really, it, it kind of stood out to me, like wow, if they didn't go and get this girl, she would have been waiting for somebody you know and actually put herself in harm's way just to be saved so it was almost like they had to save her you know also made me think she has some terrible parents because i don't know how the hell they leave me <laughs> their kid behind. i was like where are your parents they need to die uh but that's a whole nother story um the other thing i thought about was um the stone element the singing stone jumped out to me as something really beautiful and something that was in the element of science fiction for me. I thought that's a beautiful science fiction touch. It's also really clever the way Data put it in her hand at the end. So she'll have some kind of memory of the experience, something to trigger her memory. So she knows something happened, right? She'll always have a connection with the stone. I thought that was a nice little touch for her. Uh, purposes of writing and then lastly i'm gonna say and you know this is one of the reasons why it's difficult for me to have a personal relationship or connection with picard and his character the backstory they give him is of an elite aristocracy Mm -hmm. and he has grown up on a castle and he he's drinking tea and he's an equestrian and he fences these are all things that the regular working class people don't do i've been horseback riding like once or twice in my life i it's not a normal thing i've never been fencing it's not a normal thing for people in the inner city or poor people in general to be going out and buying swords and fencing it's an elite aristocracy of a background and that's the disconnect that i have when i see him because i don't feel like he represents the common man experience that i have gone through and that's where my disconnect is i wish they gave him more of a background that was somewhat more humble and relative to the experience that we all generally have this seems way too marginalized and it is a picture of the elite white men that we have historically seen depicted in the world and they're not giving him any flavor in that background to kind of mix it up so that i can say oh okay yeah he's got a 
cultural upbringing that allows him to have this really wide perspective. This is a very narrow kind of upbringing, in my opinion. So it's uh, it limits my ability to connect with him because I don't see those same commonalities that I have. Um, and so that's that's my final take on. It. Got it. All right, everybody, in the comments below, tell us why you also don't like Picard, that snooty <laughs> no, captain. No. <laughs> Everything you were saying, I was like, boy, he yeah. is kind of snooty and elitist, isn't he? <laughs> Very much. A little bit, a little bit. Shakespeare, uh, and it's just yeah. all just, you know. And those equestrian it, pants. Uh, and, yeah. and, he has a vineyard, right? So. Yeah, he's yeah. got like, everything. <laughs> he's got everything. <laughs> All right, everybody, so, yeah. that's it for us. But thank you all, especially to uh, Eve England, my live in Tokyo, Chris McGee, Sue Gruner, Jason the Outrageous Oaken, Gregory K. Wickstrom, Faith Howell, Carrie Schwent, and Allison Leach Hyde for myself, Strock Lofton, Melissa Longo, and Mr. Aaron Eisenberg. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next time. And until then, always remember the seventh rule.